Discussions in Depth Psychology is powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute. Your host is Bonnie Bright. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Discussions in Depth Psychology, which is powered by Pacifica. I'm Bonnie Bright, and I'm honored to host this series, which brings you discussions with some of the individuals who are contributing to the field of depth psychology in really profound and important ways. And today, my guest is Anne Belford Ulanoff who is a Jungian analyst and author. And Anne is going to be presenting at the upcoming conference at Pacifica in Santa Barbara, California, called Trauma and Transcendence, Depth Psychology, Spirituality, and the Sacred. And you can learn more about that conference by going to pacifica.edu and clicking on the events link there and then the retreat at Pacifica. So, Anne, I'm really thrilled to be spending some time with you today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I'm very excited to be talking about some of the topics that have been very central to your own career and your scholarly studies and research, and you've written several books. And so I'd like to first start out by reading a biography for you so that all of our listeners have a little more background on you, and then we'll jump into the conversation. Fine. Anne Belford Ulanoff, Ph.D., is a union analyst in private practice in New York City, a member of the Union Analytic Association, and former Christiane Brooks Johnson Professor Emerita of Psychiatry and Religion at Union Theological Seminary. An internationally known lecturer and prolific author, among her many articles and books are the highly acclaimed Cinderella and Her Sisters, The Envied and the Envying, Spiritual Aspects of Clinical Work, The Wisdom of the Psyche, The Unshuttered Heart Opening to Aliveness slash Deadness in the Self, The Living God and Our Living Psyche, and madness and creativity. So, Anne, with that body of work to your credit, and I know that's just a few of the works that you have created, but such important topics, and really I notice a lot of themes there around spirituality and how the psyche is actually affecting us and how we are living our lives in relationship to the psyche. Of course, all of these are very much union and depth psychological topics, I'm really curious as we begin here, if you can just share a bit about your story about how you came to be a union analyst and what's most rewarding to you about that practice. I became a Jungian analyst by becoming a patient. I had no idea of this as a career. In fact, I was quite prejudiced against it. So I was led into analysis out of an inner need of my own and It took me, the whole process took, and out of my experience as a patient grew the hope to become an analyst. I've worked for many years as an analyst, and I do think that's the best way to enter the career path. If one enters analysis in order to become an analyst, it takes a lot longer because you have to go down to being a patient. Because as Augustine says, you can't give what you don't have. And if you've never really been an analyzant, really, because it's necessary and you desire it, it's very hard to work with people who need you to know how necessary it is for them to be in analysis and how much they want to work on whatever the issue is within themselves and in relation to other people. For me, it is a wonderful and exciting field. It continues to be very exciting to me, though I've worked for many, many decades. And there's so many things that are rewarding about it. The principal one is the psyche is the subject itself, and it is possessed of its own agenda, which mixes in with a person's personal agenda, the problem to be explored or the solution to be found or to realize that's not the problem. That's just something knocking on the door. And once the door opens, they're taken into an entirely different room and learn an entirely different scope to their own life. But the psyche is the object and the subject of the work, and it is so interesting to me. And then everybody with whom you're privileged to work, they're different. 
they're things we share in common, but the particular way they're put together or the particular solution that finds them is simply fascinating. And then there's a great deal of seriously funny things that happen. It's life. It's your life in the office as much as it is the analysance. And, of course, the relationship between you is a flexible and a many-layered medium through which the work gets done so that you're involved, you're relating to somebody. You're not just thinking up ideas in yourself. It's a grounded, ordinary, humdrum day with the most extraordinary flashes happening on Wednesday's morning. (laughs) <laughs> That's so beautiful. And, of course, it could be Tuesday morning or Thursday morning. I, I'm very well aware. It could be any morning, yes. yes. <laughs> exactly. You know, I have your book called The Unshuttered Heart. Mm-hmm. I've had it for many years, and I have gone through it many times. And, of course, it's all underlined with various things. And this morning when I was preparing for this interview, I was thinking about your work and anticipating this opportunity to speak with you. I just opened it to a page, and I noticed something that I had underlined. And it says, we can find our depth by being found in the depth. And it almost sounds to me like from the way that you described your own experience of being in an analysand, before you ever came to the work of being the healer or in that opposite chair, that that perhaps is what happened to you in that. Can you say something more about that idea of finding our depth by being found in the depth? Well, it's just so surprising. Take the obvious example, easiest to give because you can cite something briefly, a dream. You can't make up the dream. The dream makes up you, and some dreams you really get right away, and they tell you something you never knew before, and it's as if you're being addressed. Other dreams are so opaque that you may not know what they're about for years. And then there are lots of dreams. One patient of mine said they're like dresser drawer dreams. You just dump the dresser drawer in your psyche and out comes this and that and it doesn't seem to mean anything. But the depth there is that something is addressed to you. And I remember one woman I worked with who was very smart but she was uneducated and she relied on her dreams a great deal and she said because it's not your idea and it's not even my idea. It's something in me that talks to me And I believe I have to listen to it because it says things I can't think of by myself. So that's one example of depth. Another example is if you're working over time in a relationship with the analyst and analysant, things can happen there that you don't get to by yourself. It isn't that the analyst gives you answers. It's that things occur to you when you're trying to tell the analyst something or when you're arguing together or when you're blocked together. Things occur that don't occur outside the analysis time. And that's sort of amazing. It's creative flashes that happen. So those are positive kinds of depths. Then there are lots of negative depths of terror, sheer terror that you can't stand to think about. Nightmares will do it, and you're so glad about electricity, that somebody invented electricity because you could turn your light on and know that you're not hanging by your heels over a cliff. You're in your bed, and there are your bedroom slippers on the floor. But the negative also takes you down, and if you're in a good, solid, working relationship, you Become able to bear more and more than you would be able to do by yourself. And that's a depth that may uncover a lifelong sadness that's haunted you all your life that now you begin to understand and you now can afford to see what that sorrow is about. Or it might be a lifelong madness a chunk that's crazy that you could not afford 
to make room for, and the analysis makes room for it. So your perception of yourself, your perception of reality changes radically. But it's these kinds of personal, particular, very varied according to each personality. It's those kinds of experiences that are the depth that analysis can engender. You have such a beautiful way of describing that in a way that makes so much sense to me. And I can completely understand, as I listen to each of those concrete examples, why you say the psyche is both the subject and the object. And I also get the real sense of how one can, through the analysis, begin to develop a very strong sense of relationship with all those various parts of themselves. Yes, that's very exciting. You just suddenly have a crowd or you have a whole zoo of animals that you never thought of. It's really great fun as well as makes you weep at least quite often. Exactly. Again, beautifully said. So I know that one of your interests centers on Jung's notion of the psychoid, and that's something that you'll also be talking about at the conference. That was a concept that took me a while, I remember, when I first heard that word, to begin to understand it. And honestly, it's probably one of those concepts that may take one all one's life to really begin to come into some kind of relationship with that particular notion. Can you define the psychoid for us and then also explain why you think that it's important? I don't think I can define it. Jung doesn't clearly define it, but I can (laughs) describe it. And it's something that he both knew early and mentioned here and there, as if he'd been talking about it all the time, but in fact he hadn't been. And then in his later work, it comes out. And I got to it out of a clinical experience. And then I went and researched it, and I've spent a lot of time with it. My last book is called The Psychoid Soul and Psyche piercing space-time barriers. And the psychoid refers to unconscious processes that are unrepresentable in word or image. We live them, but we don't know about them. And they can make us feel mad, not angry, but crazy, And I believe they can also be a third source of healing. I now think Jung really enunciates three sources of healing. I suggest the psychoid is the third, though he doesn't say that so explicitly, but I would say that. I can describe it. It's an experience that is not given to abstraction, hence it's difficult to define but I can describe characteristics of it, which I did in that book, which sounds as if it's all about theory, but it isn't. That book is full of concrete clinical examples that have to do with the psychoid. But let me give just the barest. It's this unrepresentable level of the unconscious processes. He would say the archetype, for example, is of a psychoid nature, Meaning by that, you don't experience it directly. You experience it through derivatives. An emotion will grip you. A behavior will possess you or compel you. Images would arise or attract you, all of which you could say, let's just choose an obvious example, around the mother, the figure of the mother. The mother is good, the mother is bad, The mother is great mother. The mother is my dear old mother. The mother I am. The mother I wish I was. That would be a typical archetypal constellation. But the psychoid process and the archetype itself is not something you meet directly. You meet it through your experience of it. And it's not knowable and definable in a convenient way. The thing that stands out about it and that relates it to synchronicity, though, the psychoid and synchronicity evoke each other, and both, for Jung, have moments of making you feel connected to what he called the unus mundus, the one world, the larger surround 
not just in which we live, but in which life is. So it has social, international, environmental, chemical, and cosmological properties, this one world. But the thing that stands out about the psychoid process and archetypes too, because he does say they're a psychoid in nature, is that the experiences manifest physically as well as psychologically, psychically. And they're not two parallel processes. They're two sides of the same coin. So that they're astonishing experiences when they happen. And Jung thinks of consciousness sort of sliding between instinct at one end when it would dominate and the spirit at the other end when it would dominate. A third aspect of the psychoid and of synchronicity is what I mentioned, that they both usher us toward this experience of the one world of which all of life is a part. And as in a synchronistic experience, which he describes as non-causal elements coincide and bestow on us or impact us with an experience of deep meaningfulness. And we aren't clear whether the meaning exists external to us, though it feels it does, but somehow we also participate in it. And we know we have not invented this experience. So something's happened, and in these experiences, synchronistic or the psychoid, the ego way of living, of differentiating, of having a time and a space sense, all those familiar markers dissolve. It's all time, not just past or present or future. It's all spaces, not just there, but also here. And in those experiences, Everything is present simultaneously. So the ego can feel completely overwhelmed and feel mad in the sense of madness. And or one might feel liberated from the usual structures in seeing the wholeness of the whole, seeing the all in all existing in it in the moment. So... It's a major kind of experience, and it's, uh, fourthly, a kind of what Jung calls a transgressive experience. All the usual boundaries get superseded. We transgress them. Archetypal constellations go beyond their frame of reference. Psychoid processes upend the way we usually define things, and It depends on where you're coming from, whether it frightens your wits out of you or whether it liberates you. It's like a leap to another way of perceiving the real. And I'm interested in its effect clinically, in the actual experience clinically and especially of grave clinical matters, the suffering of trauma. So the simultaneity of everything all at once, which feels on the negative side like chaos, might also on a positive side feel like plenty, like abundance, that makes us feel unmoored from our usual crippling defenses that are impossible to relinquish. They just sort of fade away. The boundaries with which we define things And in trauma, you're fixated on very painful, repetitive, compulsive boundaries. They yield. You need a sturdy relationship analytically with your analyzant and the analyzant with you to survive these experiences. But it adds something to the clinical venture that is really quite wonderful in my experience. You're still in your role of analyst or analyzant, and you're still looking at the patient's material. And the material in trauma is usually desperately full of suffering. 
but the two people who are in their roles are also two human beings together facing the forces of destructiveness and creation, creativity in life itself. And the analyst gets there in the participation in looking at those forces through her own root, her experiences of suffering, of destructiveness or creativeness. And we're in the material, the materia of the patient, so we're already there through the analyzant's material. But it adds a quality of equality to the usual analyst, analyzant, dyad, horrible word, I hate that word, but it's convenient <laughs> here. So it's very exciting, and I'm interested in it a lot. And other analyst schools, Beyon would be close in his talk about O, that you cannot know it or define it, you have to be it. It's similar accent, but I think Jung, in his description, you have to realize Jung is decades before these other people. He always adds something that the others don't like. I mean, I could go on and on, but the example with Bion is, Bion's O is formidable and wonderful, but Bion does not describe O as interested in us. Now, there are books written that are interesting on O in Beyond's theory and self in Jung's theory, and there's lots of congruence and conversation possible. But in Jung's theory, you get the feeling that whatever it is the self represents, because the self is just a symbolic concept that points to something, whatever that is, you get the feeling in Jung's theory that it is interested in us. And that's a major difference. And, of course, if you're interested in spirituality, one would say, well, that's God, or whatever you define as God. That in a God-human relationship, there's mutual interest back and forth. And that would be unique to Jung, I think. So anyway, that's to do with the psychoid. But if we stay with the psychoid... We will not talk about anything else. (laughs) Exactly right. Yes, I mean, it's such a huge topic. But I have to say, you have really sparked my imagination and my capacity, I think, to understand, as you were describing the psychoid processes and how they upend the way that we define things and they lead to these leaps of perception, essentially. I can also see then how trauma does tie into that. You mentioned that, and of course, you've kind of waded into that already But it really makes me perceive trauma in a way that it can be a portal to something new and different. And as you say, it can feel negative or overwhelming, particularly if we're touching into that unus mundus. But it can also really lead us to that sense of abundance, which you mentioned. And so I'm trying to figure out how to tie it all together because there's just so many threads and my brain is kind of sparking all over this. But you had mentioned beyond the concept of O, which for those who aren't familiar with it, he described really as the ineffable or the unknowable. Do you have examples or case studies about specific instances of when you've observed transcendence emerging out of trauma? Are there other examples or case studies where you can more concretely illustrate to us that sense of trauma as being a portal or going from trauma to transcendence? Well, you really have to have clinical examples. Clinical examples are hard to give because they require many details to make them real. And there are a lot of them in my psychoid book, and we don't have that kind of time. But trauma is terrible. It can be acute or it can be chronic. No big event happened, but like a water torture, drip, drip, drip over years, something was really off and it started so early that you just thought this was reality. But it dealt a hurt that you feel is beyond repair. That's the hurt of trauma, that it's beyond repair, that you're damaged, that there's a dent in you or a rent of your circumference. There's a gash and you're stuck there and you're stuck in there and you're wounded 
and you're not sure you're going to survive it. So with the remarkable capacity of psyche to cope and to invent, defenses are erected and walls are erected and images are erected that both terrify and keep us away and wall off to protect us so we can live in another chunk of our lives. But the wound is there, and the wound is in us. And the psychoid is a notion about the scope of the psyche and has in common with physics, actually, leaping to another perception. And the word transcendence, which Jung uses in multiple ways, interchangeably, in all the ways are completely different and contradictory, sort of. Transcendence is something that at least evokes something larger, something that changes the proportion, so that you look at the wound that you feel is beyond repair from a different point of view, from a larger point of view. And the psychoid that is an experience of everything simultaneously all at once without the markers of the ego life that define a universe and a galaxy, the psychoid surpasses those. It's more akin to their multiple universes, their multiple galaxies. How is it possible if that's true? that we who are hardly a dot have all this concern with an inner life or a path. I mean, that just seems loony. But on the other hand, that larger perspective, experiencing it, it pulls you loose from your trauma. It works it and reworks you. And how would you come out? How would I describe that? The wound may always be there because serious things happen to us and they're dreadful and you can't fall back on good comes out of evil. It's not enough. So the wound may always be there. The wound may always be bleedable. It's not all healed up, scabbed over. It may be and it may be healed, but it may not be. But we no longer live in the wound of trauma. The wound of trauma lives in us. That's the difference. So that we're not defined by the trauma. We can suffer it. We'll go on suffering it. But it has its place. And its place is limited. It is in us. We are not engulfed in it. Transcendence, whatever meaning we give to it, and I'm wrestling with that for the June conference, gives us that larger perspective. And the experience of the psychoid level does too. So that gives you an idea of where the healing comes from. Well, it's just such a pregnant ending, I think, as we come to a close here to really begin to contemplate where that wound lives in us. And I'm sure each of us can point to something that we have wrestled with over the course of our lives or are wrestling with now. And as we look out to the greater culture, it's the same thing. There's a lot going on in the collective that yes. really could be described as quite traumatic as well. Yes, and and we're particularly keenly aware of it and suffering how much violence is going on in the world, in the neighborhood and across the nations, and how many people, just the huge plight of the huge number of refugees, it's traumatic for civilization. How to handle that? Are we handling it? Just thousands of people with nowhere to blaze their head. We're in a time now that a lot of archetypal foundations we've taken for granted and relied upon as foundational I think are all upended now, being upended, and it's a time of great collective anxiety. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. Well, all of this is such a critically important conversation, Anne, and to be continued in June at the conference 
as I mentioned, Anne is going to be speaking at that conference at Pacifica in Santa Barbara, California. It's called Trauma and Transcendence, Depth Psychology, Spirituality, and the Sacred. And you can learn more about that by going to pacifica.edu and clicking on events and then the retreat. And Anne, I'm just so grateful for your time today. I have personally learned so much and you've just opened a lot of new doors for me to really think about things. And so I do look forward to that conversation being continued. Of course, I've been speaking with Anne Belford Ulanov, who is a union analyst and an author. And her latest book is called The Psychoid, Soul and Psyche, Piercing Space-Time Barriers, which I'm going to be ordering immediately, and I was not aware <laughs> of that book. So I'm very excited about that. And you can find out more about Anne's books and her work by Googling her. She does come up in several different locations online. And thank you so much. It's been just fascinating. Thank uh, you very much. You've been listening to Discussions in Depth Psychology, powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute with host Bonnie Bright. Learn more at pacificapost.com or at pacifica.edu.